Hi, I'm Tom Meehawk. Welcome back to this chapter called Purchasing Strategies, Buying Motor Vehicles and Purchase Complaints. Welcome to my personal finance course. Thanks for coming back. This is segment two out of two, the second section in uh, this chapter. And let's jump back in. So the last slide we looked at was purchasing a motor vehicle. We said there were four stages, gathering information, considering alternatives, determining a purchase price, and then after purchase activities. Let's take a look at these a little, in a little more detail. So gathering information, determine, determine the types of vehicles that suit your needs, your taste, your budget, right? What kind of car do you like? That's the question. Take a look and see what fits for you. There are plenty of sources now for information. It used to be you had to dig, 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 talk to people, read on, there wasn't online, before there was online. Read newspapers, read magazines, go to the library, not anymore. Everything's available online. There's so many websites and sources. Certainly, you can still look at TV, magazines, listen to podcasts if you have, you know, auto hobbyist uh, podcasts or things like that. Personal references, family, friends, coworkers, your peers. People say, you know, I, I drive this car, I drive that car. No doubt you've been in the cars of your friends or your family and admired certain ones. Well, those are good ones to choose. There's no reason any longer to not know the cost for the seller of the vehicle and therefore the likely selling price or the car's value if it's from a, an independent or a private seller, right? So if you're going to buy a car from a dealer and you can tell, you know, you can look up, you know their cost, you know, they can't sell it for less than that, most likely, or they can certainly maybe sell it for equal to that if it's the last day of the month, last hour of the day. But you certainly also know what the private individual is likely to want to be able to get to. So, the best sources, Kelly Blue Book, Edmonds, Consumer Reports, Auto Trader, there are lots of them on the web now that provide good and accurate um, and up-to-date information about what it should cost to buy a car. Consider several year old cars, meaning used cars. Brands though with superior records for operation and retention of value. This avoids depreciation, which is that large drop off in price when you drive the car off the lot, right? When I worked in uh, one financial advisory firm I worked for, it seemed like everybody that had to drive a lot to see clients would buy, you know, three and four year old used cars of major well-known brands with reputations for retention of value and good operation. Um, the car I own now is I bought three years old and it's safe and it's comfortable when it's clean it looks great and um, it's been great to drive with my family it's been a, a very a very good choice i've had it for a long time now now second stage consider your alternatives see and test drive the vehicle right at dealers um get in it see how it feels for you take it out on the road take someone with you right know what you're looking for but we'd be willing to listen for ideas the car that I drive now is the second of the identical car I like it. And I've had the same kind for, believe it or not, 20 years. Two cars, 10 years each. Same model, same make. The second one is updated. And I had no idea. I went into the dealer. It was a snowy day. My kids were then young. Snowy day meant no activities. And at that point, I was driving all the time to the airport, flying all around the country every week, somewhere different and coaching sports on the weekends. And I needed a car that was durable, safe, completely reliable, and uh, not terribly expensive. And um, I didn't have a definite idea. The, I, I fortunately met a good salesperson with experience who, who was decent, decent person. And, uh, and he led me to the car that I ultimately have now had for 20 years. But be open, my wife has a car and she uh, liked this particular model, this particular brand, and went in, looked at certain models, and they said, hey, how about this one? And she wasn't looking for that at all, but liked the way it felt, liked the way it drove, it was a special, they had extras, or they were trying to get rid of it, or both. It worked out well for her. Also, try no-haggle dealers, like CarMax, CarSense, Carvana. People sometimes complain that maybe the prices are higher, but for people who don't like to negotiate, that could work out well. And, you, and, and there's the sense that you're getting value for what you pay. By the way, in the last point, I just meant to mention that, you know, be, when I we talked about be open to ideas, 
the dealer sales representatives can be knowledgeable too. So are they trying to sell you a car? Sure. But if you find a good one, find the right one who wants to build a relationship, wants to sell you a car, but doesn't want to overwhelm you, they can, they, their knowledge can be very helpful. Determine preferred options and features. Do you want a sunroof? You know, every car now comes with air conditioning. Um, do you want air conditioned seats, heated seats, leather, cloth, you know, these kinds of upgraded sound system. These are the kinds of things, TVs in the back for kids, the kind of things that you should know, would be helpful to know going in. Now, if they throw these things in for no additional cost or some very small cost, well, consider them. And seek recommendations about dealers and sellers. Word goes out. If you're in a community where people have families, kids, a community where people walk in the street or at least see each other now and then, or you're involved in community activities or clubs or things, you have a ready source of recommendations for dealers and sellers for cars. Third step, determine your purchase price. Do your homework. No prices for your car, the options that you want for the car's age and mileage. These things are easy to look up these days. So do that before you start to your negotiation. Don't be shy about negotiation. If you do it in person, go with someone else. Bring a family member, a spouse or a friend so you're in a better position to gather and digest information as you negotiate. It's not easy to take it all in, think of what you're going to say. You want someone to double check and say, oh, they're going to they're going to give you this and give you this, but they're charging how much more? You know, we should be we should say, no, no, I'm not paying this much. I'll pay this. Right. If you're young or you're uncomfortable negotiating or something like that, bring someone who's experienced at it with you. Again, there are places where these no haggle um, companies, CarSense, CarMax, Carvana, where you don't have to do that. But in general, car buying still involves some negotiation. And so I recommend learning how to do it yourself. But if you're not good at it, or you're young and haven't done it yet, or have a personal view against negotiating, bring someone with you who will help you. Okay, and bring someone with you anyway, because the information comes too quickly. The information flows too quick. You need someone to help you. But certainly if you're not a negotiator or haven't done it yet, bring someone to help. Shop near the end of the day or the last day of the month. The end of the month. Shop near the last day of the month. Near the end of or the last day of the month is what I'm trying to say. When we bought my wife's car recently, we went, I think, literally in the last day of the month. I think it was August. And we got attention like you wouldn't believe. And they wanted to sell cars that day. And um, we got a very good deal. I don't think we got a, a great deal, but we got a very good deal. And it happened faster. Still took a long time. We were, I think, at the dealership for six hours, trying cars, trying this one. Oh, what about this one? Try this one. And negotiating. Be willing to walk away as part of your negotiating. Be willing to walk away. That's one reason why maybe you don't want to do it on the last day of the month, because if it's five days before the end of the month, you can walk away and come back. But be willing to walk out, right? Because that's an important negotiating tool. Check and double check the price as various options change. If they throw this in, take that out, try a new car, it has these three things but doesn't have that, make sure you're still getting the same thing and still getting value. Check financing packages that are being offered to you. And if at a dealership, double check your the prices as they may offer you different models to look at. Choose an experienced salesperson, preferably a car lover of that brand, someone who owns that brand. The person I bought my first car from, of the two that I mentioned I've had <clears throat> for the last 20 years, he owned that brand and he loved it. And he referred me, he, he let me see someone that had the car I was looking at that he had sold to not far away. Um, we were able to walk up and take a look at it. It was a, a feature that I was looking at was this, this, they called it a moon roof, retractable so that it opened up over top of the front and the back seats. And when our kids were young, it was great. They could stand on the back seats and pop their heads out the top when we were parked and look at, you know, 4th of July fireworks. We could open it up and it wasn't quite like, but it was it simulated a convertible. It was great. In the winter, you could open it up turn the heat on, still be comfortable. And he wanted to, and the salesperson wanted to show me this, this, this uh, moon roof in a car that he had sold. So choose an experienced salesperson. They can be a great benefit for you. Financing. 
Check your bank for rates compared to what dealerships offered. For the last 10 years, 15, 20 maybe, dealerships have offered attractive rates. Now, whether they catch that up in fees and things, make up for that in fees, I don't know for sure, but it's been my experience that the dealerships have offered very competitive rates and there's been no reason to go to your bank. Make sure to check the APR for all the costs because the APR is what helps you to compare apples to apples. It includes the fees and the interest rate in the cost of financing. Now, leasing, it's a great, great, great uh, question. You generally have lower payments, smaller initial cash payment. What you're essentially doing, if this is the total cost of the car and you're owning the car between you know, right taking it off the lot in year three, let's say, right? You're basically renting between, and this is zero when the car is worthless. You're basically renting the car's value between the new car price and the year three price, right? You don't own it. You're basically renting it. You're subject to mileage maximums, charges for overage, if you go over those miles. Make sure you understand the terms of the lease, the financing rate, the fees, especially the residual value. That's this value here in the third year where, you know, the amount that you're financing between the purchase price and this residual value. And make sure you are, uh, understand the monthly payment. Now, here's the thing about leases. For somebody who, I mean, there was a time when my, my kids were much younger. I mean, now they're grown, but when they were very younger than when they were standing up at the moon, out of the moon roofs, looking at 4th of July fireworks, younger than that, we needed a, a safe car, four wheel drive we wanted for ice and snow. And so we leased because it kept our, it kept our payments low relative to other things like mortgage we had then and, and uh, you know, other costs of running a household. And so um, owning is, is better in my experience, if you own it for a long time, I've owned two cars for 10 years, I've come out far ahead. Once you get to the fourth year, or third year, fifth year, whatever, at the end of your payments, the car is yours. Now you do have to pay then for maintenance and that can be expensive, keeping it running. But I think the longer you own it, if you maintain it and the maintenance is not too expensive, the repairs, it's worthwhile. Leasing can be good though for this reason. It can give you the upper limit, your lease payment, as long as all maintenance and repairs are included. It can give you the upper limit. If you're paying $300 a month for a lease for the three years, if all maintenance and repairs are included, that's your upper limit. Maybe you have to put in, you know, windshield washer fluid and replace wipers, you know, but, but anything else is covered. So you know there's a limit. And that's one reason that people look for leases. It's a great idea to keep costs down if you need to keep your, your cost. I wouldn't, by the way, do a lease and buy some super expensive car. All right, don't be 25 years old and, and driving a, you know, um, a very fancy foreign import, um, unless you can afford it. If you can't afford it, don't use a lease to keep the cost down and, and drive some vehicle that's a poor choice. After purchase, the fourth section, maintain the car regularly, service it completely for the longest operation. In other words, keep on top of it. Have it serviced if you're at your dealer or reputable independent repair shops. Some service stations will do repair work and, and maintenance work. Seek referrals, ask around, who do people use? And watch the cost. Dealers are expensive. You know, theoretically their technicians are better trained. And notice I called them a technician and not a mechanic, right? You know, sign of the times. And in fairness, cars are changing. You know, new Teslas are getting to be more and more like cell phones and to be replaceable. Uh, my suspicion is, and I don't know this yet, but my I'm an engineering undergrad, so it interests me. But my suspicion is that Tesla still has lots of moving parts, but fewer than internal combustion engine cars that have lots of moving parts and they wear out and they have seals and bearings and things that wear out and can break. So operate your car properly. Use the correct gas grade that's recommended. Fill your tires to the proper pressure so they don't wear out quickly or unnecessarily. Replace worn wipers. Drive at responsible speeds and brake responsibly, right? Don't like drive, you know, 30 miles an hour over the speed limit and then hit the brakes as you need to stop. And garage your car if possible. It lasts longer that way. Now, as I said, as I said a moment ago with bearings and seals and things like that, cars are made of lots of moving parts. And so sometimes they're not put together properly. When you have problems and you have complaints, there are things you can do. 
And here are four steps that describe what you can do, thanks to the Kapoor text, our really great personal finance text that we use in, in uh, my personal finance courses. Initial communication, return to the initial place of purchase and contact the retailer, communicate with the company, consumer agency assistance, and take legal action if you need to. Some legal options, small claims courts, class action suits, if there's a large problem that involves lots of people, you can go to consumer agencies. States have lemon laws that provide protections for purchasers of cars that fail in quality and performance. You have some rights if your car is not functioning properly and you've tried to get it fixed and it, you can't. My father, example, my father had a car. He had troubles with it. He kept taking it back. They couldn't fix it, take it back. They couldn't fix it. He said to me one time, I remember, he said, Tom, I'm going to sue this major U.S. auto manufacturer, one of the largest. I said, Dad, you're kidding. You're not going to win that. He said, I, I'm, I'm going to sue them. He did his research. He stayed with it. He sued them and he won. He won. And he ultimately, he was given a reimbursement for his car and he bought the same one. Not, not the same identical car, but the same model, same make and model. He liked the make and model. He just had a bad car. After that, he was fine. But he did all the research, did all the work himself, and it worked out well for him. And I'm glad for him. And I'm glad he proved me wrong, too. He stuck with it, did his research, and he, um, good for him, did a great job. I'm Tom Meehawk. This chapter is called Purchasing Strategies, Buying Motor Vehicles, and Purchase Complaints. You can find me at TomMeehawk.com, at Resume Optimization, at Instagram and Twitter. Find me at YouTube, my YouTube channel. And look for me, um, look for my book, Optimizing Your Resume, Proven Techniques for Competitive Situations at Amazon in ebook form now, but hopefully very soon, probably next week, in paperback. Thank you. Thanks for watching.